Good afternoon, attendees, and welcome to the next session of our ASEAN Future of Work Conference. Now, as we journey into the future of work, do you really understand what are the trends that will impact how we work in 2022? Now, to answer this question and more, we are delighted to have with us Josie Kang. She's the Vice President of Human Capital at the Human Capital Leadership Institute. She'll moderate this session and will be joined by Indro. He's the Executive Director, Consulting Human Capital Leadership in Deloitte Consulting Southeast Asia, as well as Sirinivas Reddy, is the Chief of the Skills and Employability Branch at the International Labour Organization. So without further ado, I would like to pass over the mic to Josie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our Future of Work panel today. Over the last two days, we've heard from keynote speakers like Josh Bershin and other speakers like Nella Richardson on external drivers of change, uh, such as the constant state of flux in the business environment, the evolving nature of the economy, the job market, skills that will thrive and succeed for us to be productive, and the growth prospects in Southeast Asia as countries learn to leave, live with the, the virus. So what does it mean for employees in general? Um, what are the key trends that will impact jobs and workers in the region and over the next five years? I'm now going to direct my, my question to Srinivas. Uh, to share with us his perspective. Srinivas, please. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Josie. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for having me on the uh, conference, this uh, important interactions. Um, the trends um, that uh, you may have already discussed during the last uh, sessions, uh, I would like to see from three particular angles. One is the changing nature of jobs, uh, two, changing nature of work organization, and thirdly, the, our readiness. You know, what does it mean for uh, all the people and, and particularly HR um, professionals? Um, in fact, changing nature of jobs is one of the um, main uh, concerns and, and uh, great inquiry that ILO has carried out during the last five years. You know, what, what will be the future jobs and therefore what are we supposed to do? Um, as uh, you may have uh, joined in the national dialogues and global dialogues, um, one of the key issues that has emerged in terms of the ILO centenary celebrations is the changing nature of jobs and how one looks at it in the future. Um, a major uh, finding that is very clearly coming out of these dialogues is uh, the new economies that are going to dominate the world of work scene. The three new economies, digital economy, green economy, and care economy. While the traditional sectors will continue to obviously provide jobs, but what we have to really clearly see is, you know, are we ready to embrace economic opportunities offered by these new economies? And I think, uh, for the Asia Pacific region also, this is very, very relevant, either digital, green, and care. So when we look at these three uh, new economies and also the traditional uh, economies, uh, coupled with the changing nature of the work organization, we have seen, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the various types of uh, changing nature of work organization. Um, be it uh, earlier, obviously, um, you know, telework, and working from remotely was mainly from the you know the IT sector and other industries, but nowadays now it's no longer you know relevant to only that. So this hybrid work and various forms of work organization you know, through the um, platform work and gig and flexible arrangements, uh, all of this uh, is another very uh, clear trend that is going to obviously stay with all of us. The third and important element is, you know, the preparedness to uh, accept these changes and, and readiness to accept these changes. Are we ready? I think uh, one of the major skills that is uh, um, in great demand is adaptability to change. In one of the recent uh, dialogues in Europe, that has uh, stood as the number one. Whatever occupation we may be in, our adaptability to change is one of the major demands because that is what is the need of the hour. Now, our readiness uh, in terms of uh, the, either the HR or you know, the people that have to carry out jobs uh, obviously requires a new set of skills. 
So reskilling and upskilling becomes very, very prominent and important in, in really equipping ourselves to handle this trend. Uh, investing in people, this is one of the major call from the ILO centenary declaration that increased investment in people is the absolute need of the hour, you know, be it uh, uh, ordinary workers or in any sector or people looking for transitions because one job for life is no longer valid. People have to undertake multiple transitions. So from school to work transition, but work to work, work to family, family back to work and work to retirement and even, you know, deferred retirement. So these multiple transitions can only be handled if people have the opportunity to continuously upskill and reskill. And that is where a very important role for all of you, the HR leaders, to see how can we support this upskilling and reskilling revolution as part of a lifelong learning approach. That is also, I think, a very important dimension we need to see. Uh, let me stop here, Josie, and, and we can go into some of these aspects uh, in, in, in great detail uh, later. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think what you shared, um, you know, is the sentiments are echoed by the Singapore government as well, because there's been a lot of effort by the government in terms of, you know, focusing on support for investing in people, reskilling, retraining and um, support for career transitions. OK, I'd like to now ask um, Indro, do you have a different perspective to offer in terms of what you see are the key trends that will impact jobs and workers? Josie, um, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, do I have a different perspective? Yes and no. Um, let me start with no. Uh, I don't have a different perspective on what the trends are. Uh, the trends are reskilling. The trends are adaptability. The trends are new jobs, new, um, new forms of work, uh, remote work, hybrid work. We all know that. Um, so I do not have a different perspective on the trends. I do have a different perspective in terms of where we are, where we are paying attention and the, uh, and the assumptions that we're making about the future of work. First of all, I, I, I've, I've done a lot of research in the area of future of work. I, I ran the COE for, for Deloitte globally on future of work. And um, even though I... Uh, have spent a lot of time on this on this topic of future of work. I've stopped using the term future of work because it's meaningless to me. Uh, what is happening right now is uh, is is uh, not not trying to figure out what the future is going to look like, but trying to make the current a lot better. So I find the term modern work to be much more representative of where we should be paying attention. We should be paying attention to today, not 10 years down the line, uh, because there are lots of things to, to, to upgrade and, and look at. So that is first, modern work rather than future of work is in my opinion, the right way to think about it. The other aspect of this, which I do have a difference of opinion is that what I noticed today on the, on the topic of future of work is that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the actions and the narrative and the communication is coming in, in a certain direction. And that direction is that, you know, uh, consultants like, like me and my firm, uh, you know, Srinivas's organization, ILO, WEF, et cetera, are coming out with points of views about what the future is gonna look like. Um, the governments are picking that up and trying to, you know, tell the companies what to do and how to navigate the future of work. The CEOs are picking that up, asking their HR departments to you know, do something about it. And then the HR department goes and tries to lecture the employees to navigate to the future of work. And I find it funny and a little disturbing because uh, actually, if you look at that adaptability thing that Srinivas talked about, the ability to respond to the rate of change, all the research tells us that individuals are far more adaptable than organizations. And organizations are far more adaptable than public policy. This is just fact. And we have today a scenario where the, the, the vector of lecturing is going in the wrong direction. We need to be able to look at those employees who are actually quite adaptable, quite resilient. The workforce is actually incredibly adaptable and resilient. Look at what happened during COVID. It wasn't that the organization suddenly became adaptable. It was the workforce themselves 
taking agency in their own hands and trying different experiments and trying different things. And they showed, every individual came together and showed that actually the workforce as a collective is far more adaptable than we give it credit for. So I honestly feel that our vector of thinking about this has to move from looking at what organizations need to do to, to looking at what individuals are already doing. And I think that organizations need to pay attention to what individuals and pockets of employees are already doing and support that and, 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 and raise that and elevate that rather than constantly kind of tell people, you know, you don't know what you're, what you're in for. Right? <laughs> the future is going to be very dramatically different and try to scare people to change. So that, that's the, the difference in perspective that I hold. The key is to pay attention to individuals. They are very resilient. They are very adaptive. And, and we need to pay attention to that. Thank you for that intro. And um, amidst all these changes, I really like what you what you term modern work and you know the need to pay attention to today and helping today and looking at the pockets of um, employees or individuals that are you know adaptable and making that change and supporting them instead of the other way around. Um, but amidst all the different changes that are happening and the uncertainty and the volatility in the environment. Um, how do you, do you have a perspective on how employers and workers can build a resilient mindset and culture that can adapt to these business disruptions? I'm going to ask Indro for his point of view first. Indro? Right. So, so resilience is, is an interesting one. And, and it, thank you for asking me that question because, uh, once again, I think that individuals are far more resilient than they get credit for. And organizations are far less resilient than they think they are. Right, so uh, the resilience question therefore has to again, go to the individual uh, and an and acknowledgement that individuals actually have resistant resilience built into them already. The role of the institution then comes to question, right? What can we do? Before I suggest what we can do or what we should be doing, let me clarify what we should not be doing. And I find a lot of organizations coming to me and saying, we want to run a program for resilience for our employees. We want to, in effect, teach them how to be resilient. And I'll look at that and I, and I see there's something wrong with that premise because I see every single individual today, especially uh, at, at junior levels, uh, frontline managers, et cetera, being incredibly resilient, they're doing so many different things, balancing so many different things, and they are actually showcasing and role modeling what resilience looks like. And all of a sudden you would have a academic coming in and lecturing them on resilience as part of a program, which is well-intentioned, and HR wants to run that program. And I find that uh, disturbing because that would not increase their resilience at all. What I find better to do in this scenario is if you look at the research on, on, on motivation and resilience, uh, look at the work that Neil Doshi and, and his team have done in this area, which I quite like. Um, the number one thing that drives this kind of adaptive <laughs> performance or you know, a, 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 an approximate proxy of resilience in the, in the realm of organization performance um, is, is the notion of play is the notion of the ability to experiment at work, to, to design your work as a series of experiments and, and, and have some interest and fun with it, as opposed to um, live a life of extreme uh, pressure and um, you know, both intensive pressure as well as um, inertia, uh, pressure that comes from not doing anything. Um, but to redesign and re-energize uh, ourselves by, by rethinking of our work as a series of experiments. So if you take this, this notion of experimentation, that is a good place to intervene for the organization. To say that rather than come and lecture you on resilience, let me see if I can remove the obstacles inside the organization that are getting in the way of your being able to set your work up as experiments. If you want to try a new let's say software, if you want to try a new tool, if you want to try a new mechanism or a cadence of meetings, a format of meetings, as an organization, I want to encourage that. 
And that to me, I mean, there are lots of things that an organization can potentially do to build resilience. But as simple and as basic as that sounds, that is much, much more effective because the research tells you that that is what is going to drive the needle on resilience. And you will have those individuals who are already being resilient and trying out different things look at you and say, thank you for taking some of these obstacles out of the way, rather than come to me with, you know, models and, and uh, you know, frameworks uh, to teach me the theory of res resilience. So that, that's the way I would think about it. Thank you, Indro. It sounds like you're saying that you're suggesting that, you know, instead of a standalone kind of training, um, that working on the actual business or, or projects um, and supporting them in their experimentation might be a better way to support resilience um, or build that adaptability and resilience mindset. Yes. Um, Srinivas, do you have any perspectives to offer from your experience or clients that ILO works with? Thank you, um, Josie. Just to complement what Indro has said, basically, I would also add that here is an opportunity for organizations to become learning organizations, work organizations also to become learning organizations, develop the culture of learning and, and uh, really encourage innovation at all levels. If necessary, demolish the, the, you know, the kind of uh, obstacles that may be there, uh, both in terms of seniority or any other hierarchical uh, you know, barriers that may be there need to be demolished for the organizations to become really resilient and, and thrive. You know, as Indro said, uh, if we have to really promote the redesign and, and re-energizing and rethinking process, that requires a kind of openness and culture. What can we learn from organizations that have become resilient and, 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 and have grown out of this pandemic? There is a lot to learn. You know, a number of organizations that provide for that kind of an innovative culture, an open culture, young people, and you know, young or old, you know, there is no, there should be absolutely freedom to innovate, freedom to redesign, freedom to propose anything, and you know, the rewards and recognition system should be such that they capture, irrespective of whether it is proposed by a vice president or a new, you know, new entrant intern. So the intern can bring a revolution. We believe in that. I think the organizations can be resilient. Obviously, one need to also invest in. Uh, the, the whole issue of preparation, preemption, and you know the culture of uh, learning. That's why, you know, from an ILO's uh, skills point of view, I would also strongly, uh, you know, kind of advocate that we need to see work organizations also as learning organizations. Thank you for that, Srinivas. Um, as the chief of skills and employability branch at the ILO, can you also share? you know, how you're working with ILO constituents to develop skill strategies in response to the COVID-19 crisis and also to prepare for jobs of the future. Earlier, you mentioned there were three new economies that you, you were looking at, um, the digital, the green, and the care economy. So perhaps you could focus on those three areas. Thank you, Josie. I also just want to reiterate again that these are the new economies that one needs to take into account but also not undermine the capacity of the existing traditional sectors to you know, contribute to jobs. For example, much parts of Asia and, and large parts of Africa, rural economy continues to be very important. So investing in agriculture, investing in rural economy continues to be agriculture. So these new economies should not uh, in any way undermine the existing uh, sectors that, that give a lot of uh, you know, jobs. But obviously, the new economies and the trends, the digital and green, for example, will have impact on everything you know, that, that we can already see. Uh, even the agriculture organization is, is taking through a lot of changes by infusing new technologies into agriculture. Similarly, we need to you know, achieve uh, carbon neutrality practically in almost every sector. Then, you know, and, and therefore, um, the, the need to emphasize on that. What we are um, being approached um, by a number of governments and our partners, employers and workers organizations, one of the major number one uh, ask is on skills anticipation. You know, how can uh, you help us or assist member states in anticipating the skills required uh, for the present? Okay, let me also subscribe to what Indro has said for the present, you know, uh, kind of jobs. 
but also the changing jobs, the evolving jobs, because we know that 10 years down the line, we don't even know what are the jobs likely to be and what, the, what those skills will be. Now we are, we, are st- we are seeing a continuous change in, in, even in job descriptions. Nowadays we have jobs like uh, we have never um, you know, thought about such uh, jobs. Now I've seen uh, that there is a head of uh, hybrid work now, you know, people are hunting for. Um, and all types of you know, new jobs are emerging practically every day, maybe every week. So the, 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 one of the major uh, supports that we are giving to member states is on, on really um, establishing robust labor market information systems, you know, dynamic labor market information systems in the countries so that they're able to monitor the changes in the labor market, obviously linking it to the priority economic sectors. So the key you know, support also from our side is how can skills and education policies be integrated with the other economic and development policies, you know, including trade policy, fiscal policy, you know, and, and also the, you know, the kind of economic growth that a country wants. So education should not be seen as only an initial education only kind of a thing, but if we are talking about a lifelong learning. But if lifelong learning has to be the you know, organizing principle of education, that has to be linked to the priority economic sectors that a country want to promote. So you know, that is another important dimension we are supporting. How can countries develop lifelong learning policies? Because this is a paradigm shift. Initially, education was only just initial education. You graduate and then you throw out the books and you think that is done. But it is un- uh, paradoxically, now we are advocating that one has to be involved in lifelong learning and reskilling and upskilling is a continuous process until the retirement. If that is the case, what is the role of establishments, organizations, HR professionals, and uh, government, and also the you know, workers' organizations? So our take from the ILO is it is a shared responsibility to promote lifelong learning. Uh, individuals and enterprises have a, an enormous role. At the same time, government has a, an important facilitating role. So we are supporting member states to develop lifelong learning policies, financing skills development, and uh, anticipating skills. And a third important dimension is, all of this has to be done through uh, a process of social dialogue. One of the other major requests we get is how to involve business and private sector in in more active role in developing skills, because that is where the whole issue of skills mismatch between what is being produced in the schools and colleges, and what is the demand of the labor market, there is a huge skills mismatch. The respect of the level of economy, practically everywhere, you will find that employers complain that we do not get the people with the right set of skills. Whereas, you know, graduates complain that I'm not being hired, you know, I have a master's degree, postgraduates and all of this. So how do you reduce the skills match, mismatch is to bring the employers and workers together and, and also the industry closer to the um, education, school of, uh, you know, the, the world of uh, education. So the key message from outside is bring the world of education and world of work closer through the participation of employers' organizations and workers' organizations in a process of social dialogue. So our take is very clearly, this is what we are supporting member states. You develop skills policies, lifelong learning policies, and various other mechanisms through an active participation of private sector and also the workers' organizations and government facilitating this process. Thank you, Srinivas. Sounds like you're um, leading an ecosystem perspective um, for solutioning and really focusing on lifelong learning, looking at all the major stakeholders in the economy and, and then you know sorting it out from education to skills um, and employment. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we're gonna move from the macro to the micro. And Indro, would you be able to share with us from a company perspective, what are some of the top people challenges that Deloitte faces and how you're preparing for the future? Uh, <laughs> let, let me touch upon the, the, the skills piece which Srinivas has uh, laid out. Uh, and and I, I think I, I agree very, very, very strongly with the fact that reskilling is probably the number one challenge, probably number one, number two, number three challenge right now for business organizations. Um, because the, the rate of change is such that uh, the reskilling challenge is being underestimated uh, significantly at, at this point. What, what I would like to do is give you some numbers 
to put the point that Srinivas was making into a little bit of perspective for uh, the audience. When I went to college uh, in the early 90s to do my engineering, uh, the half-life of a skill, of a perishable skill, as we call it, engineering, whatever technology I was learning, robotics engineering in my case, was about 26 years. So I could go to college, I could pick up that skill, and I could uh, monetize that skill. I could actually bring that skill to work and make a living off it um, for roughly about um, 25, 26 years. And that is where the 30 year career concept um, came about because that was the half-life of a skill when I went to college. Today, when my son is going to college, the half-life of a perishable skill is about four and a half years. Okay. So while everybody is talking about reskilling, doing reskilling, setting up academies, you know, there's nobody who is saying, oh no, reskilling is not a problem and not, we're not paying attention to it. My frustration is that we are, you know, uh, to, use a, to use a Hollywood term, we are, we are bringing a knife to a gunfight. That's what we're doing. As organizations, we're bringing a knife to a gunfight. And I'll give you the numbers to prove it. If, the, if you accept, and the research of this on this is, is pretty compelling, if you accept that the half-life of some of these perish, perishable skills, the technical skills, is four, four and a half years, actually it's about between three and a half, four years right, right now, and is diminishing every year, even if you take four and a half years, right? And if you do the math and ask yourself how much uh, reskilling time investment is required to keep my workforce, just at a level of relevance, not even like ahead of the curve, just at a level of rel market relevance, how much time do I need to devote? The math on that, if you just do a straight line, is 100 days a year for an employee. That's why I say that we're bringing a knife to a gunfight because yes, organizations, governments, everybody is trying to take the the volume of learning or, or, or courses that people are going for from maybe four or five days a year to six, seven days a year, right? But that is not at all relevant if the skill itself becomes irrelevant in four and a half years. So we are doing our employees a massive disservice in that case, right? I don't know of any organization that has the balance sheet to put 100 days of training uh, in an employee Say I'll pull, pull you out of productive work to spend go spend hundred days of training, and and I'll fund it. That, that, that's just not possible with the current balance sheet, right? right? So that is where modern work comes in. That is where modern work comes in because we have to embed learning, not conceptually, but at a practical you know level with specific mechanisms into the project work that we do. Let me give you an example, right? So one of the things that um, we, we say as, as part of modern work is that you have to turn your workflow into a learn flow. So if your workflow says that, okay, I'm going to work in two-week sprints, all right, then at the end of, at the middle of every sprint, at the end of every week, there needs to be a couple of hours retrospective, which is what did I learn from the week just gone by? What are the things that we tried, the experiments that we tried, what worked, what didn't work? That element gets into your work to the extent, Josie, that it goes into your calendar. And it is considered productive time to do a retro. And that is just one element of what it means to turn your workflow into a learn flow. My frustration with what I'm seeing in the market right now is that there is a lot of conceptual ideas around reskilling that are being put forward. There is a lot of head nodding among HR professionals saying, yes, this is important. A lot of head nodding among CEO saying this is important. But when it comes to do the hard work of changing how every employee's calendar looks like and how to embed 20, 30% of time in actual learning activity as part of the project, funded by the project, that hard work is not happening. And without that, I go back to my point that we are bringing a knife to a gunfight and we cannot keep pace with the speed at which these skills are getting irrelevant. So what is happening is employees are obviously noticing that. So they are saying, you know what, if I want to be relevant, my organization is not going to support this or doesn't have the resources or the willingness or the capability to support this. I'm going to move on. And that's why we're seeing so many people leave their jobs right now.
because they're beginning to realize, you know what, if I spend another two, three years in this environment, I'm going to be irrelevant in the marketplace. And this whatever X percentage uh, increment that my organization is giving me is uh, just going to vanish into thin air. So actually, employees are realizing that. And, and it's time organizations did as well. Thanks for that, Indro. It sounds like um, it's aligned with what Srinivas was talking about in terms of building an, a learning organization, because you were uh, giving a, you know, uh, an illustration of how that could look like um, applying learning and reflecting as you go along 20% of your time, rather than you know, attend a, a skills training program, um, like a standalone training. Um, so if I can just ask one question, I think we have time for maybe one question. Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, let me just take a quick look. No? Okay, so um, at this time, I would like to invite anyone in the audience to uh, post your questions if you would like the uh, panel to answer them. But in the meantime, let me just ask you one question, Srinivas and, and Indro. If you could choose one, what is the one skill that you think will significantly impact jobs and workers um, in the next five years? Srinivas, you go ahead. Thank you, Indro. Um, Josie, as I mentioned in the opening, I think that one skill that everybody is asking these days is adaptability to change. Uh, this, this is uh, all encompassing. Obviously, it is not one skill in, the, in that sense, numbering sense. You know, it, 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 it has several variations. Um, if you look at, for example, hybrid work, uh, in order for hybrid work to be successful, you know, obviously we have seen the great advantages during the COVID pandemic, you know, the, the element of telework and, and flexible arrangements, uh, people liked it. And when it is continuing, and if it is going to be the norm, for example, you know, there is a lot of learning needs to happen, both at the organizational level and individual level. At the organizational level, if you look at, for example, from a control-based, supervision-based regime to a trust-based regimes will have to be put in place. So you trust your people, you know, the way they are sitting is no longer going to be that important in certain work organizations. Let them feel, you know, comfortable wherever they may be. In order for that to accept, the leadership change requires, you know, complete change mentality. You know, if, if a leader believed in total control, he or she wanted to see his people, her people every single day in the location, gone, that is gone. So uh, then how do we, you know, really invest in the capacity to embrace change, lead the change and accept the change and also understand the requirements of the others. So if you look at from a, a HR professional's point of view, first of all, I would strongly also feel that we obviously need to invest in upskilling and reskilling of the HR teams from leadership down to everyone. You know, how do we understand this change? How do we uh, lead this change? And how do we support this change? Because it has several variations. If I take again the example of, uh, you know, telework and hybrid work, you know, unfortunately at a macro level, we have a very complicated situation now, a world that can telework and a world that cannot telework. This is a worry. Uh, what is some issue for us at the ILA? Because, you know, a lot of people, highly skilled, highly educated can telework, but, you know, millions of people at the lower rung and in the, in the rural areas, agricultural areas, low skilled, they cannot telework. They've lost jobs, you know, millions of people. So that's a macro issue that, you know, governments, employers and workers organizations need to really ponder over and see, you know, how do we bring everybody along? You know, it has to be an inclusive hybrid work, if at all, if it is going to be sustainable. Otherwise, you know, hybrid work cannot be sustainable only for a small set of people, then inequalities will continue to grow and, and therefore it will be an imbalanced society. So, you know, when we are talking about these, all these advantages of hybrid work and all, we need to also understand the play, plight of hundreds of millions of people that cannot deliver. That's a macro bigger picture issue. At the micro level, if we see the, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, narrative that we are seeing also, each individual has, you know, different set of circumstances when he or she is teleworking. Some, you know, very comfortably do it. Some face challenges, you know, some face isolation, some face, you know, you know, the, the sheer uh, 
you know, the opportunity to interact with the people is lost in you know, for quite long, and and that creates a lot of uh, you know, well-being issues. So all of this, uh, you know, we should not say it is your headache. You, you wanted to tell you work, I've given you you your headache. You fend for yourself. You do whatever you want to do. So you know, people may end up doing long hours of work. People may end up doing you know, may end up having issues with the family. Whether it is good for work-life balance, it sounds like yes, because people have the time sovereignty. But if that person is working, you know, instead of eight hours, if the person is working for 14, 16 hours, then how can you really say that there is a possibility of a good work-life balance? There is, there isn't. So there are so much of individual differences, you know, context. So are the HR teams ready to understand these individual differences and tailor personalized solutions? So that's why you know, the, the, if an organization is looking for head of uh, hybrid work, I think that is the right thing to do, uh, to really uh, obviously develop people-centered inclusive policies. You know, that is the need, right? that's very clearly need. And therefore in all of this, you know, participation of workers and workers organizations in any of these things that what we do in order for them to be sustainable is fundamental. That's why we advocate uh, a process of social dialogue. Yes. Thank you for that, Shrinivas. I think I think you're right in pointing out that you know um, to support adaptability and resilience, right? The HR team really needs to upskill itself and um, you know to have a more business acumen, business minded approach to to provide solutions for the organization that will work for the employees as well. Um, Indro, I'm going to direct um, one of the audience questions to you instead, right? And the question really is that um, it's about, oh wait, hang on, where, where is it? Yeah, okay. So it's from Jonathan um, and he or she says that, you know, as a HR practitioner in hospitals, um, in this day, we, we need skills in digital tech and skills to directly engage the patient. What is your advice for hospitals to develop our hospital services and the type of technology we need to invest most critically in this digital working era. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, we, we are working with a couple of uh, hospital chains at the moment on, on this very topic, but I don't think we have enough time today to get it very deep into the, uh, the, the stack, the technical stack of skill sets. But I'll, I'll just make one very quick point, right? So, um, whether you are a hospital or um, you know, pretty much any um, service organization at this moment, uh, there is an underlying framing of, of skill sets that actually doesn't change much from, um, from industry to industry. So th this is the interesting part because we keep saying that, okay, no, every industry is different. Every industry will have a completely different stack of skills. Um, the research suggests that is not the case, right? So there is something called um, a, a digital value stream. So it goes from, you know, product, CX kind of skills, customer experience kind of skills, you know, pr uh, product design, customer experience, um, marketing and, you know, reaching outreach and not just marketing, but patient outreach, et cetera, kind of skills, um, data kind of skills. And then you get into um, application development, artificial intelligence, security, data privacy, security, cybersecurity, et cetera, and operations, technology operations kind of skills. So that is your value stream. And that value stream is more or less, uh, uh, you know, st uh, stable and consistent, I would say, consistent um, across, uh, you know, uh, pretty much all service care industries, right? Now, obviously that is one, uh, lens to look at the skills through. The other lens to look at the skills through is what is the use case that you're going to use it for? And that is where your industry knowledge comes in. So is the use case around how patients get onboarded into the hospital? Is the use case around how they get how, how, how they do the payment and how they deal with the insurance uh, issues? Is the use case around how they get um, all of their information about, about their health and well-being in one place? Right, so th that, that's the that's the element of understanding what are the unique use cases that you want to work on. But the skill sets, the domain of skills, is essentially across the digital value stream, which goes from, as I said, product all the way to security and operations. And once you understand that that value stream, you can then 
begin to build you know, centers of excellence or academies or capability areas, et cetera, et cetera, capability models that allows you to address that. And then you go to the business side and then you articulate what the use cases are. So it, in, in a very simplistic way, the way we are thinking about this is get the use cases very clearly, get the value stream sorted, and then you'll be able to see what are the specific areas and gaps that you need to fill. Well, hopefully that helps. That's a one minute answer to a, a significantly uh, sophisticated question. Thank you so much, Indro. And thank you as well, Srinivas. I am so sorry, everybody in the audience, we don't have time to, to go through all the questions that you uh, listed, but I will make sure that the organization uh, the organizers get back to you on some responses. Um, again, you know, thank you for um, joining us on this panel. And I hope that Indro and Srinivas shared with you a different perspective of future of work. And with that, um, thank you for joining us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. Josie. Sorry, everyone. Uh, just uh, bear, bear with me for a minute, please. So to our attendees, uh, thank you for attending this panel discussion. So we have now come to the end of the ASEAN Future Work Conference. But uh, the, there's one more session going on at the HR Tech Festival Asia right now. It's about key HR and employment law updates across Asia Pacific. So do hop on to that session right now. And we look forward to having you join us for the next ASEAN Future Work Conference at the HR Tech Festival Asia event in 2022. In the meantime, please do submit your feedback on this session via the link provided in the chat box right now. And once again, thank you to our panelists and we hope to see everyone again. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.